Okay, great. Well, welcome to today's uh, APS GPC seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Eli Zipperman from Harvard University. Eli received his PhD in physical oceanography from the MIT Hui Joint Program. And after uh, spending some time uh, as, a, as a scientist uh, and a faculty at the Weizmann Institute, he joined uh, the Harvard faculty as a professor of oceanography and applied physics. Uh, Eli has uh, worked on a range of problems in atmospheric dynamics, ocean dynamics, uh, climate dynamics of the earth, of the current and the past times, as you see in this uh, very exciting title. He also has done a lot of amazing work on the climate of other planets. And his work has brought a lot of insight into our fundamental understanding of, uh, of the climate system. Eli has also been the mentor to uh, many uh, now very successful students and postdocs who came from a range of uh, backgrounds. Uh, and so we are very excited that he's here today to tell us about uh, some of his work and his uh, perspective on, on climate science. So Eli, please go ahead. Great, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to this. So let's see, hiding some panels here. Okay, yeah, so I'm hoping to talk about um, very warm climates. The motivation is the Eocene, the climate of 50 million years ago. But as we found out, some of our surprise was definitely relevant to the 21st and maybe 22nd century. Um, so let's see. Introducing the problem, uh, we can start here. Um, so this is an event, a cold air event, passing over Minnesota. So you see the temperature over Canada is very cold, and the air is advected toward North America. And one can easily, from such events, can get temperatures that are minus 40. And uh, as it says here in this radio station, it takes five minutes for your skin to freeze. So this is the situation today, basically a few times every winter. Let's say uh, contrast this very cold air over North America to what happened in the past. So this is a period known as equable climates, so warm climates that lasted during this period of 140 something to 30 something million years ago. And at that time, you find um, crocodiles and alligators and palm trees in Wyoming, for example. So, Wyoming, there's a very famous uh, fossil site. And, and in that site, they see remnants of crocodiles and alligators. And you could see here that these need mean annual temperature larger than 14 Celsius and cold month means, say January, warmer than five degrees. And, but more importantly, alligators, crocodiles, and palm trees are examples of frost intolerant species, which means that if the temperature drops below freezing, even just for one night, if the soil freezes for one night, then they can survive. So that means that during millions of years, the soil never froze where today, the temperature is easily 40 degrees Celsius a few times every winter. So we're trying to explain this discrepancy because be between the very cold temperatures one gets today in continental climates away from the moderating effect of the ocean. And at that time where uh, the temperatures never dropped below freezing for many, many years. Okay, so the question is how could these uh, creatures survive? Um, the intrusion of this polar air that I showed in the previous slide from, say, present-day Canada. This is the slightly bigger picture. So what's shown here is a time series from zero today to, say, 60 million years ago. And this would be the deep ocean temperature as function of time. And you can see today is here. You can see a warmer period three to five million, two to five million years ago, that's known, this is the period known as the Pliocene. Our interest is in this period where the deep ocean temperature reaches 12 degrees Celsius. And if the deep ocean temperature is 12 degrees Celsius, it means that this deep water that was formed in the Arctic is an indicator that even the high latitudes did not go below 12 degrees Celsius. So that's a very, we have two powerful uh, constraints. One is that temperatures never, never drop below freezing in the middle of continents, place like present-day Wyoming, and two, that the deep ocean was 12 degrees Celsius, which is really warm, and that's an indication that the poles were also warm. Okay, so we're trying to explain how this could be. Um, and it turns out, of course, that if you just um, increase the CO2 in a climate model, it doesn't necessarily do that. So there needs to be something else rather than just CO2, as you'll see in a second. Let me say a few more words about this period of, uh, of say, 50 million years ago. So 
we have global high mean global temperatures we have a, a low equator to pole temperature difference so the temperature difference between the equator and the pole today is 45 degrees celsius while at the time it was about a half of that because the equator was a bit warmer but the pole was much much warmer so an important thing to explain in a in these past warm climates is the fact that the low there's a low equator to pole temperature difference and we said that these constraints that show us that uh, the, the that the winter temperatures at 60 north, including in the interior of North America, uh, was al always above freezing, which is surprising. Um, CO2, we don't know what the CO2 was at the time. The estimates vary from 500 to 5,000. So we just have to live with this uncertainty. So when it goes, it comes to these past climates, um, on the one hand, there are very exciting problems to solve. On the other hand, there's a very large uncertainty that we have to deal with with always. So you know, it's a it's a balance. And this is what the Earth looked like. So the continents are close to where they are today. You know, except for the fact that Australia is a bit further to the uh, to the south, and and the Atlantic is narrower than it is today. But generally, the continental configuration of the Earth is similar to today, in spite of the fact that the climate was very different, making this a very interesting climate uh, to understand. You know, same geometry, but very different climate is interesting. And it's referred to as equable climate, both because the pole is equal to the equator in terms of temperature or more equal, and the winter is more equal to the summer than today. So mild winters and warm pole, poles is why people refer to this as equable climate. Mm. All right, why do we care? Um, so we care because we're making good progress towards such climate. And you can see here the RCP 8.5 is the business as usual scenario. Uh, and this shows the global warming expected as function of year. And you can see that we're expected to reach say eight degrees Celsius at 2300. And, and this gets close to the range we're talking about in this uh, geological evidence. So, um, and we've already seen this. This is the sea ice in the Arctic in 1978. So you could see that all of the Arctic in September, this is the winter sea ice, this, the winter sea ice at its minimum in September. So you see the Arctic is completely covered by sea ice, including the space between these islands and along uh, Greenland and so on. While in 2012, which was the lowest point at this point, half of the Arctic is ice free. And for a long time, we, we used to explain to people that the Arctic is losing its sea ice, but in Antarctica, there's no uh, observed difference anymore. Uh, but last year, 2023, this is Antarctic sea ice as function of month, month. And you can see all, the observe, all of the observed years over the last 40 years where we had satellite observations. You can see how unusual 2023 is. The maximum sea ice was like several standard deviations away from the normal sea ice around Antarctica. So now the Antarctic sea ice is also responding to global warming and we see a very strong effect. So our motivation is one, it's an interesting problem that happened in the past and two, it looks like it's gonna be an interesting problem that might happen in the future as well. Um, wondering if we could stop and see if there are any questions at this point. So let me stop for just half a minute and see if someone wants to ask the question either by unmuting or by sending something on the chat. Okay, I'll stop again later. So if there are any questions, please save them for that. So I wanna talk about two different mechanisms that explain these warm temperatures that I just talked about in the past and maybe in the future and the two and, and the, this address the difference between this cold temperature that we see every winter this this time, uh, this uh, in the present, so, you know, cold air forming over Canada, advected toward the US and causing these very cold temperatures. And between that and between what happened during the dinosaur period and after the dinosaur period, uh, where you had tropical settings, even in places like uh, the, uh, the interior of continental United States. So for that, we're going to need basically two feedbacks. So the first feedbacks I'll talk about is low clouds over the continent during winter. So low clouds, that's like basically a fog layer over North America. And this fog layer I'll show will have a very strong greenhouse effect and that would keep the continental 
um, North America warm even during winter time. So that's feedback number one. But it turns out that when cold air events happen, the air comes typically today from Siberia, goes over the Arctic, makes it all the way over Canada and arrives to the, to the center of uh, North America, present day United States. So for the air to be, not to be as cold as it is today, you want to make sure that the Arctic is not ice covered. And for that, we're going to invoke a different feedback. So this would be, again, a cloud feedback, but this time convective cloud feedback. I'll explain what that is. So these are high clouds during winter time, and, uh, and they keep the Arctic ice free during winter. And then that allows this, these low clouds to develop over the center of the continents. And together, these two feedbacks allow, hopefully, North America to be uh, nice and warm so that these alligators and the and, uh, palm trees can survive. That's the plan for today. So two feedbacks in two different halves of the talk. These are some of the papers that describe all of that. So they span all the way from 2008 to 2024, you'll see later. Okay, so the first part is most was mostly done with Tim Cronin when he was a postdoc with us. Um, and this has to do with this low layer of clouds over North America. So we started out, the team started out by following an experiment done by Judith Carey in 1983, trying to explain how this Arctic air formation actually happens. So the idea is this, you take a one dimensional atmospheric model, a column model, so one dimension in the vertical. So that represents an atmospheric air column. And you start that air column over the ocean. So we're assuming that, we're assuming that the ocean temperature is close to freezing. And then this is height. So you see that on day zero, that's what this is. On day zero, the temperature just goes down as you go up in altitude and 600 um, hectopascal corresponds to about four kilometers in the atmosphere. So these are the lower four kilometers of the atmosphere. And you see the temperature going down, starting at zero the surface. And then you move this air column over from the ocean to over Lensa to over Canada, present day Canada. And now the, so the surface, instead of being ocean with a high heat capacity and a temperature doesn't, that doesn't go below freezing, now the temperature can very, very rapidly cool because the surface has a very low heat capacity and it's, it's radiatively cooling to outer space. It's winter time, so there's not much, and there's not much shortwave radiation, not much solar radiation. And as a result of that, the air cools very rapidly. So the next profile here shows the situation after two days. At the surface, the air cooled by already 15 degrees Celsius. And then you can see it's back to this profile later up here in the atmosphere. And then after a few more days and less than a week, it gets to about minus 40 Celsius. So the surface cools very, very rapidly. Again, the reason is that there's no shortwave radiation, no solar radiation on the one hand. On the other hand, the surface has very low heat capacity, so it can um, cool very rapidly. So that's what happens today. This is basically repeating the experiment that Judith Gary uh, performed previously. So now we're going to take this experiment and repeat it in a warm climate world. So now we're assuming that the air starts out over, say, the Pacific Ocean, and the temperature this time at the surface is 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and then this is the profile that we're starting in when we're assuming with, and we're assuming that, that the that the moisture in the air is at 80% relative humidity. So we start with a very warm air. As a result of that, the air contains a lot of moisture and now we're moving it over land again during winter time. So the air moves over land and starts cooling. It doesn't have the anchor to uh, the initial ocean temperature anymore. The surface is still a low capacity, uh, low heat capacity surface. So the cooling is rapid initially and we lose 10 degrees in the first two days. But then after that, as you can see here in days four, six, maybe even eight, the cooling pauses. So there's no more cooling or very weak cooling. So something happens after two days that prevents further cooling from happens from happening. And we'll show in a second that these are these low clouds that I mentioned before. Let me just reiterate. So what happened here? I started with an air column over the ocean. The ocean this time was 20 degrees Celsius. The moisture content is very high because we're starting with 80% humidity, just like before. But this time at 20 degrees Celsius, 80% corresponds to much more moisture. Now we're moving over land. There's an immediate cooling. 
That cooling means that the air becomes saturated because the saturation moisture goes down. The air is saturated, you're forming clouds. These green patches indicate clouds. You can see low clouds. These low clouds have a greenhouse effect. And this, green, this greenhouse effect prevents further cooling for a, for a while until after a few more days, the clouds basically dissipate, you know, precipitate the, the moisture and the clouds will dissipate and then the cooling can proceed. But for a while, the cooling stops and we have about a week or maybe even more before the temperature drops below freezing again. And by the time that happens, the air column is off the North American continent into the, say, if it started over the Pacific, flew into North America, now it's over the Atlantic Ocean and it's replaced by new air that again comes with lots of moisture, cools a bit, creates these clouds, and by the time it's off and cooling even more, it's off uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. And this way, North America is always covered according to this very simple model with the low clouds that prevent cooling. So again, I'm supposing to see if there are any questions at this point about the mechanism before I continue with some details. Okay, great. So you can see the difference between the cold case where the temperature started at zero and the warm case where the temperature started at 20. The difference is that here the cooling was very rapid and here the cooling was only rapid initially and then it paused because of the clouds <clears throat> and then uh, that allows the surface to be above freezing. And this is, these are these clouds that we're talking about. Okay, looking at some of these details, so we look at the orange curves here. So what do we see here? Um, we see, um, I guess maybe this one would be helpful. You see the moisture of the air. So um, you can see the moisture um, uh, is... is um, is sustained very high for a long time, allowing these clouds to develop. So this is liquid, liquid moisture in the clouds. You see it's increasing initially when the air saturates and, and condenses. And then once you have con condensation, the liquid droplets remain in the air for a while before they dissipate by precipitation. And you're going back to no clouds after about nine days or so. So this is the period of about a week or eight days in which there's plenty of clouds and these clouds have a very strong greenhouse effect and they keep the surface from uh, cooling. And that, that's how we are hoping to explain the surface not going below freezing. Okay, right. So we find something very interesting. Let me explain this um, calculation that Tim did. So what's shown here is the following thing. We're asking the question, how long does it take the air to go below freezing. So you move an air column over the continent from the ocean that started out with a certain temperature. How long does it take to go below freezing? So the vertical axis is time to freezing, time it takes to get to freezing. The horizontal axis is the initial temperature. So, so far we looked at zero degrees and 20 degrees. Now we're looking at the whole range of, um, of values. So you see that as long as the initial temperature of the ocean is below 10 degrees Celsius, the time to freezing is basically just a few hours. That's what this line says here. But if the time, if the initial temperature of the ocean is 15 degrees Celsius, then the time to freezing is a week. And that allows us to explain the warm temperatures at the surface uh, over North America, even though we are far away from the moderating um, uh, effects of the, of the ocean. And you can see that there's a nonlinear behavior here because the temperature the time to freezing doesn't change very much and then it increases rapidly. So the question is, how do we explain this nonlinear behavior? And it turns out the explanation is actually very simple. In a cold climate, this is what the temperature looks like as a function of time at the surface. We get an initial cooling, radiative cooling to outer space until some clouds form. Even in a warm climate, we get some clouds, but that cooling takes us below freezing. And then there's a plateau when these a uh, few clouds that are formed prevent further cooling and then we have additional cooling. But the initial cooling in the first few hours already take us below freezing. However, in a very warm climate, when the ocean is very warm, say 15 degrees Celsius, the initial radiative cooling still leaves us above freezing and then the clouds form and keep us above freezing. There's a long plateau because there are more mo there's more moisture and more clouds. And, the and then, so we have a long period above freezing and then finally we get cooling again. Uh, so this is how we explain this nonlinear behavior and here um, 
of the time to freezing. It's either in a cold climate, the initial warming, initial cooling takes us below freezing and the plateau happens below freezing, or in a warm climate, the idea is that the initial cooling takes is, is still leaves, leaving the air column at the surface to be above freezing, and then the clouds prevent it from cooling even more until, until the clouds dissipate and we get additional okay, cooling. Can I ask a quick question? Um, great, great. Is this time to drop below zero Celsius a function of both initial temperature and also the moisture um, percentage? Great question. Okay, so yes, it is. I think all of these experiments assume 80% moisture at the beginning. But if you started, you could draw this as a function of the initial relative humidity of the air, and it would probably look um, uh, well, I suppose it would depend on the, the time to freezing would depend on the initial um, moisture of the air. So yeah, absolutely. It depends on both. All of these plots are 80, assume 80%. So, so if you have like warm initial temperature, but like you can you find an equivalent moisture content that gives the same time to drop below zero yeah. as yeah. cold initial yeah. yeah, I would say if you start with warm initial conditions, say 20 degrees Celsius, but no moisture, all of this effect can happen, cannot happen, and you will not see a plateau like this. So you'll just have continuous cooling. Thanks. Great. Uh, Thanks. Ali, could I ask you a question very quickly? Yes, absolutely. The the cooling that takes place higher up in the atmosphere above the boundary layer at night, um, presumably that also depends on the concentration of IR emitters, particularly water. And so does it matter? Does water matter in that context? Water vapor in this case matter in that context as well, that if you had a, a lot of it, you might actually have a faster cooling rate. Or is that just a small effect? I mean, there is such effect for sure, but it seems like the greenhouse effect of the of the cloud layer is is uh, sufficient to keep this going. You know, if you have long radi long wave radiation from the top of the clouds, is what you're saying basically, right? Just like in stratocumulus clouds or something. Well, well that's got to be very important too, right? That's and if right. You, and or, the temperature drops too low, then it's unstable, right. and it would mix down the cold air would mix down even exactly. with the cloud and the boundary layer. Yeah, exactly. Or you could have clear sky, enhanced clear sky long wave radiation because of the presence of water, presence of water vapor. But clearly, what happens here is that these effects are dominated by the greenhouse effect of the cloud itself. That's a great question. OK, thanks. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to have more, so people can just unmute themselves. OK, great. So basically, this is that this is what um, and, and the, we're talking about this, everything covered by low clouds. It looks beautiful in this picture, but this picture is taken from above. If you live under the cloud, it might be a bit less pleasant. Uh, but that that's what we're talking about, clouds like that. Low clouds cover the surface and so nice picture, I think. Okay, so that was a simple um, a simple um, color model. Um, and then we moved uh, to a three-dimensional model. So this is a set of experiments. Let me look at the time here. It's great. This is a set of experiments in which we change the sea surface temperature in an atmospheric model run from present day to a, to a run in which we specify surface temperatures of 20 degrees Celsius and above. And let's just focus on this thing right here. The coldest, um, the coldest two meter temperature, so the one percent minimum temperature, uh, is much higher. And the reason for that, it, that's what this contour plot shows. And and the reason is very uh, strongly enhanced low uh, clouds over uh, North and North America. And if you look at the Probably the distribution function of temperature is it moved from the blue case in the pre-industrial run where we're completely below zero in winter time to the red one where there's a small tail below zero but mostly above zero. So the, the of course warming the sea surface temperature makes a big difference, but the main effect seems even in the three-dimensional model is the low clouds over land that have a strong greenhouse effect. So that's consistent with this uh, one-dimensional color model, which is nice. And then, yeah, this also eliminates the inversion of the surface, but I'll skip that with your permission. Um, okay, given the time, I'm skipping this as well. Now, it's well known that the two reasons, there are several reasons for polar amplification in the present climate. So, you know, the fact that the Arctic warms 
much more than the tropics in the present, and that's expected to be in the future. So you see this. This is a projection for the future, 2100 or so. And you can see that the, the warming is all the way from the South Pole to the North Pole is roughly five degrees. And then there's a large increase in the Arctic. And there are several reasons for this polar amplification of the expected warming even, and even the observed warming. And one of them is the albedo effect, but the lapse rate is an important feedback. So without getting into many details, um, uh, Tim and I um, suggested that this enhanced uh, surface warming changes the lapse rate at the surface, and that can further amplify the, the warming at high latitude. So we're basically saying this may also play a role in Arctic amplification in a future climate. Okay, so to conclude the part about um, uh, this feedback, so we discussed Arctic air formation based on Curry in 1983, where rapid cooling of marine air masses once they travel over land uh, happens during polar night, and this uh, this happen, This leads to very cold temperatures at the surface. So once you warm the climate and you bring moist air from the ocean to overland, this, this uh, delays the freezing of the air uh, because of the formation of, uh, of clouds that have a strong greenhouse effect. And you have this effect of the rapid cooling and the plateau, as you can see here, um, while the clouds persist and then further cooling once the clouds dissipate. And this works in, in our simple calculations when the SST is, um, when the warming of SST relative to present day is roughly larger than 10 degrees Celsius. I mean, sorry, when the sea surface temperature is lar larger than 10 degrees Celsius. And this might explain the survival of this frost intolerant, these frost intolerant species, palm trees and crocodiles during this equal climate. And it may also be relevant to the future uh, at high latitudes, possibly the 22nd century, because you need a high CO2 for all of that to happen, and you want the melting of uh, winter sea ice. And we show that it's highly nonlinear in terms of the time to freezing and so on. So maybe I'll pause here and see if there's another question before proceeding to the next half. Question. Go, go ahead. Um, Ellie, um, two or three slides back where you showed the maps of the, the cooling in the clouds. Can yeah. you go back to that? It looked like uh, you had um, you had a lot of clouds also over Siberia, low clouds, but there's a lot of cooling there. Can you explain right. that? Okay. <laughs> Great question. So there's, there's also evidence that in Siberia, the temperatures didn't go below freezing. It's not as powerful, I think, as over North America. There's just less evidence there is my understanding. We seem to be doing better over North America in this particular model, run. And yeah, that's all I can say. I guess uh, you uh, you noticed something important for sure. What, was there uh, were there crocodiles and palm trees in Siberia fifty million years ago? Yeah, so there is evidence for frost intolerant species in of in you know uh, Eurasia as well, um, but. You know, clearly this, this particular GCM run wasn't able to reproduce that as well. One can always blame the cloud parameterization, this and that, too, the usual stuff. Thank you. Great, thanks for the question. Okay, so I want to move into the second half, and this is motivating the second half of the talk. So we talked about cold air formation events, and this is an example from Walsh et al. 2001. So you have an air mass starting over Siberia, going over the Arctic and getting into North America and leading to a cold event here in February 1989. And you can see the path going over the Arctic. And if that's the case, you really want the Arctic to be ice free so that you can have a high surface temperature that we need for the previous mechanism to work. Remember, we need the surface temperature to be warm. And if these cold air masses go over the Arctic, you want the Arctic to be ice free. So we need to explain that. This is a, a calculation by Carl Hartig uh, just this year in which you see many trajectories leading to cold air events in this area of North America. And you can see that many, many of them go over the Arctic and start over Siberia. So we definitely want to explain why the Arctic would be ice-free during such warm climates during winter time, right? Not during summer, but during winter time. So for that, we, uh, we've suggested the following, uh, the, sec the second uh, cloud mechanism that I'd like to, to talk about. So this was originally the work of Dorian Abbott, and then the two of us collaborated with several other 
others say uh, to, to come up with additional refinements. So I'll try to describe that. So we start with the back of the envelope calculation. So an energy balance model for the Arctic. So you have a surface, you have an atmosphere, you have solar radiation. So not much during winter, obviously coming. Some of it is reflected. You have um, the atmosphere that is absorbing a uh, long wave radiation from the surface and then emitting both up and down. And then you have heat from low latitudes. And you use all of that to calculate the temperature of the surface, TS. This is the equation one gets and it can easily be solved to calculate for the surface temperature. Okay, so now you're asking, what can I change? What do I need to change in this energy balance model in order to warm the surface temperature by 15 degrees Celsius, which is exact, which is at least what you need to do. And this table, the green table at the bottom shows you that. So we need the warming of 15 degrees Celsius. We could achieve that by increasing the heat flux from mid latitudes, that's this H here by, by 1.5 petawatt. That's a big, that's a 50% increase relative to today, but one generally expects the heat flux from low latitudes to high latitude to be less high in equable climate. Long story, but essentially the equator to pole temperature difference is lower and that leads to that there's some compensation by latent heat flux, but still one generally expects the heat flux to actually decrease rather than increase. You could increase the CO2 that by itself would require a huge amount of CO2. If you take into account the water vapor feedback, then you need a 4,000 ppm increase. That's not unreasonable, but you know, uh, and you actually need the warming that is even more than 15 degrees. Um, albedo doesn't help very much during winter. The easiest way to do this is simply to change the atmospheric emissivity. And one effective way of changing the emissivity is introducing clouds. So this tells us again, that in order to change the temperature of the Arctic during winter, winter, the best way to do that would be by adding clouds that have a greenhouse effect and enhance the emissivity. So that's what I'd like to describe next. I hope that was clear. So just as a reminder, it sounds like there are many people here who don't need that reminder, but still, so we can think of the clouds as being either high clouds or low clouds in a very, very simplified way. If they're high clouds, they basically have a greenhouse effect because they allow short wave radiation to penetrate, but they don't allow heat, long wave, penetra uh, long heat, uh, long wave radiation to escape from the earth. Um, well, low clouds have a temperature that's close to the temperature of the surface and therefore the long wave radiation is similar to that of the surface while they reflect sunlight. So in general, low clouds have a cooling effect and high clouds have a warming effect. Having said that, I should note that during winter, low clouds don't reflect and therefore they also have a warming effect. So basically whatever clouds we can produce over winter in, during winter would be helpful to prevent cooling, but high clouds would be better. That's the bottom line. So we try to see if we can come, come up with a mechanism that takes advantage of these clouds and can explain why the Arctic might have been ice-free during that equable climate period, say 50 million years ago. And then we'll talk about the future in a second. So Dorian built this toy model, which is only five boxes uh, extending from the equator to the pole, one surface layer and one upper atmosphere layer. And it contains many processes. And there's a whole list here, including atmospheric convection that I'll talk about in a second. So it's a simple box model that allows one to do interesting experiment. And here's the experiment we do. We slowly increase the CO2 to some extreme values and then we decrease it and we see what happens. So let's see what happens. So these are the results right here on the left. So the vertical axis is the equator to pole temperature difference. That is the, the equator minus the pole. And it's a bit confusing because in the cold climate, the, this difference is large and in a warm climate, this difference is small. So high values correspond to cold climate and low values correspond to warm climate, okay? So now we start increasing the CO2 and you can see the equator to pole temperature difference decreasing. That is the equator of the pole have similar temperatures. And then at some point there's a jump. And then as we decrease the CO2, one gets a hysteresis, so a different state. And now we have two states. This one is presumably present day-like and this one is equable climate-like. And we try and we were interested in understanding why is it that one gets two different steady states. And so to, to do that, we look at the box model and we see what happens over the Arctic. And we find that the Arctic column in this very, very simple model starts convecting and one produces clouds, convective clouds 
in the in the polar box between 60 and 90. And these clouds have a greenhouse effect, and that leads to the warmer temperatures and the small equator to pole temperature difference. So bottom line, if I need to summarize this in one sentence, is that at a high enough CO2, one gets a different state in which the Arctic is convecting during winter. And because it's convecting, the clouds have a greenhouse effect, and that prevents the Arctic from cooling even more, and that prevents sea ice from forming in the winter, and, and that leads to this uh, equable climate behavior. So convecting clouds over the Arctic during winter time. That's the result. I need to explain why that is an unusual result. So convection um, typically happens when you know you have a warm surface, say because of sunlight, that then the say hot ground or hot ocean that warms the air here, and this air becomes buoyant and it's very moist and it's it's going up because it's buoyant because it was warmed by the surface that was warmed by the sun, and as it goes out up, it starts con uh, cooling and condensing. And the condensation releases further latent heat, and that leads to more rising and so on. So that that typically happens deep convection like that in the tropics today. Here's a, a nice animation of that sort of thing. This isn't necessarily tropical, but you can see the convection, and it's beautiful. So I thought I should show this. So we're claiming, I guess, uh, using that simple box model, that that behavior happened. Um, 50 million years ago over the Arctic during winter time rather than in the tropics uh, due to, to solar uh, radiation. That's the idea. So it's a bit of a radical claim. Okay, why does this happen? Time, I'll skip that. Basically, this leads to a positive feedback. So we start with warmer surface. This destabilizes the air column leads to atmospheric convection, the convection leads to clouds, the clouds have a greenhouse effect, and the greenhouse effect warms the surface, so you have a positive feedback that makes sure that the, the surface remains nice and warm and the sea ice can grow. Um, and that positive feedback is the basis for the multiple equilibria that we see in the book. Okay, because this is meant to be a talk for physics students, and as students, we're all enthusiastic about analytically solving everything. I just wanted to mention the good news that we were able to formulate a simple model that uh, allowed us to solve for this feedback analytically. So we write two equations for the temperature of the surface and the temperature of the atmosphere. And this contains the effects of convection and the effects of long wave radiation and the emissivity of the atmosphere and so on. And without getting, and these are the conditions for convection to happen. And then we write equations with convection and without convection. One can solve them analytically and one gets this solution. So this is the, the CO2, the base emissivity of the atmosphere. And this is the surface temperature. And you can see that there are two solutions. This is one solution that's relatively cold, still increasing with CO2. And one solution that's much warmer. This is the convecting solution. And there's an area of multiple equilibria, which explains the hysteresis that we saw before. And all of that can be done analytically, so we think we understand what happens here relatively well. Okay, so the thing is that all of these models are still very, very simple. And it has to do with the climate of uh, 50 million years ago. So let's talk about what, does, what happens in more realistic climate models and what about the future. So we looked at... Um, um, a climate model that was developed by NCAR, National, um, I guess everyone knows what that is, and GFDL, the two, two of the leading atmospheric uh, models in the US, and they're both run at four times CO2. And here's what they find. So the upper row is the NCAR model, the lower row is the GFDL model, and they're both at four times CO2. And we're looking at anomalies from pre-industrial during winter time. So what do we see? The first one shows this red patch here means that sea ice is completely gone in this NCAR climate model at four times CO2 during winter time, right? This other model shows that sea ice hasn't changed over most of the Arctic, but here there's a small area where it is gone. So sea ice melted and, and sea ice did not melt in the two different models. Okay, the next one shows that where sea ice melted, of course, the temperature, the surface temperature warmed up by 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, while in the other model, there's hardly and the, the, cool, the warming is much smaller. 
Um, now, why is it warming so much? This one has a cloud radiative forcing. So this is the radiative, the greenhouse effect of clouds is about 20 to 25 watts per meter square over the Arctic, while this model shows nothing. And finally, why are there clouds? This is convective precipitation showing that there is in fact precipitation over the Arctic. While this one, the GFDL model shows no such precip uh, precip convective precipitation except for this small area right here. So it's clear that if you increase the CO2 even more, this small area where sea ice is melted in this model would probably spread over the entire Arctic and you'll have higher surface temperature, higher cloud radiative forcing and higher convective precipitation. But these two, these two models behave as the two states of the simple model. And so you could say that the realistic state of the out climate models are consistent with the prediction of the simple model or the analytic solution, um, which is which is quite surprising, we would like to think. Uh, so that was a very satisfying result. Pausing to see if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, this is the work of Camille Hankel. Uh, so this just shows that in a more recent um, uh, CMIP-5, so, um, you know, the in, in, uh, climate model into comparison project from a few years ago, um, out of five models that ran these scenarios to 2300, four show convection. The colors here indicate convection, while one doesn't show convection. So basically the prediction of wintertime convection over the Arctic turns out to be robustly simulated by uh, basically any climate model that one looks at it uh, today. So that's that's reassuring because it's it's uh, similar to this proposed mechanism developed using that uh, toy model. Okay. Um, so, can I ask you one quick question, Ellie? Is absolutely. it possible is it possible that any one of those models started from a slightly different initial condition might go to the other state? Is this really a function of the model or is it a function, since there may be multiple equilibria, a function right. of the initial condition? Yeah. I mean, I love multiple equilibria, as you know, but I have to admit in this case, I think the multiple equilibria aspect of this isn't as robust as just the existence of a convective state. So if you go to that analytic solution, you know, there's this range of multiple equilibria, but what probably happens is that you have um, a non-convecting state, and then at some CO2, that one disappears, and this one shows up, and there's no overlap between the two solutions. That would be my guess, in spite of the fact that I love the fact that this gave hysteresis and so on in simple models. If you ask me what I think is the situation in, in a more realistic model, possibly in reality, I would, I would guess that there's no overlap between the convective and non-convective solutions, and therefore no... And therefore, the answer to your question is that probably any initial conditions would lead to the same convective state. Did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay. okay. So the challenge was that CO2 by itself was insufficient to explain the eosin warmth. And just to remind you, the idea was that we needed the Arctic to be ice-free so that air masses going over the Arctic would, would arrive uh, nice and warm to North America and allow the low clouds to develop. And we found a simple, interesting, we think, um, a climate state, it's a climate state at high CO2 where one has high latitude, deep atmospheric convection during winter time, which leads to this positive feedback that they described, which keeps the surface from freezing in the Arctic during winter time. So the Arctic is going to be ice free in summer, of course. That, that is when the Arctic is receiving more, short, more solar radiation than any other place on Earth. And then that heat is stored in the Arctic and it's not released as fast as it could have been because of the clouds that prevent the rapid cooling to outer space. And the solution is self-consistent and the clouds and convection reinforce each other and they don't need to be specified arbitrarily and so on. Um, okay, now, if you have such a positive feedback, that has an implication for uncertainty because the question is always, okay, when is this convection over the Arctic going to be triggered? And once it's, because th that means that we don't know when the jump from non-convecting to convecting behavior might happen. Uh, would that lead to a rapid uh, 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 Arctic uh, warming during winter and so on? There is some indication that winter sea ice um, allows um, for a tipping behavior. So that's again, the work of me 
Enkel mentioned here. Um, so, but we don't know when that tipping point might happen. And therefore the fact that there is such a positive feedback, whether it has to do with a uh, disconvective feedback or something else that suggests more uncertainty for Arctic warming in the future. Um, right. Um, let me pause here for just one second. Yes, there's any question. And if not, um, so I wanted to mention other explanations for this equable climate. This problem has been around for a while. So Gary, who asked a couple of questions before, came up with this wonderful idea that in a warm climate, you'll have stronger hurricanes. The stronger hurricanes will mix the ocean, the winds, and that would enhance the overturning circulation. And this would transport more heat forward, and, uh, and that would keep the Arctic from freezing. So that was one explanation. Uh, started with a nice toy model, and then there were other papers with Corti looking at it in the GCM. This this is definitely my favorite. Brian Farrell, 1990, before any of us even started thinking about it, wrote a one really wonderful paper suggesting that the Hadley cell in a warm climate should go all the way from the equator to the pole and explained how that could lead to a flat equator to pole temperature difference and and anyone should hear this directly from him because he describes this really beautifully. So this paper precedes everything else by decades. There was this work by Lisa Sloan and others, and then um, further developed by Kirk Davidoff, uh, Shrag and Anderson later, 10 years later, in which they suggested that stratospheric clouds could do the trick. So these are clouds that in the stratosphere, so much higher. And, the, and these clouds have a very strong um, greenhouse effect, so they suggested that such clouds that happen rarely today on Earth would happen more frequently in the warmer climates, and Lisa Sloan had one set of mechanisms, and the Kirk Davidoff paper had a second set of mechanisms, and Perry looked into that later and, and tried to examine whether that actually is the case. So these are three, three suggestions for how to keep the Arctic warm in an equable climate so far. And then there's, this is the most recent one, this is Tapia Schneider and collaborators suggesting that in a warm climates, mid-latitude stratum cumulus clouds would break up, uh, would break down. And then the, the, the collapse of these stratum cumulus decks uh, would lead to a significant enhancement of shortwave radiation at the surface over the mid-latitudes. Um, and that would then influence other regions and that would lead to warming. And then there are the two effects that I mentioned today. So this is the work with Tim Cronin in which we suggest low clouds over the continents in a warm climate and the greenhouse effect of these low clouds causing warming. And then there's this deep atmospheric convection during winter time over the Arctic. And so these are the two that I uh, talked about today. So there's a whole set of uh, interesting mechanisms. So I think, I think it's a, a really interesting literature myself. I'm pausing again to see if there are any questions. Right. Okay, so conclusions so far. So after these conclusions, I have a few more slides, so that's not actually the end. So we showed that these two specific cloud feedbacks provide a strong warming um, at high CO2. Um, they are both in, involve feedbacks that are triggered at high CO2 and, ex and can explain the warming over the continent and the warming over the Arctic, and the two reinforce each other. And so the two are convecting convection and high clouds in the Arctic Ocean during polar night and the low clouds over land again of, during uh, polar night. And the first one amplifies the second one. And both were developed using idealized model and confirmed using state-of-the-art climate models. I kind of like that sort of uh, style of work. I love the toy models uh, and, and, and the general circulation models are then fun to use in order to look into ideas that one develops using these idealized models. So I find that uh, fun. Um, okay, uh, maybe another opportunity for questions. Great. I think we have time, so allow me just one small thing here. So I wasn't sure we'll have time, but given that we do, I'd like to show this. Going back here. So we talked about this, we went through the conclusions. And yeah, I guess I have to mention that. So if someone wants to learn more about uh, uh, about 
uh, climate change, I suppose, in particular, that there's this book that uh, I use for a course that I have been teaching recently. And um, the book covers the greenhouse effect, the, you know, temperature effects, so whether it's warming of the surface or cooling of the stratosphere. And then we talk about the oceans, anything from sea level to ocean acidification to the collapse of ocean circulation. And, you know, the atmosphere plays a role, so hurricanes in, in the global warming and uh, featuring mostly Kerry's ideas again and, and clouds in the sense that clouds are the biggest source of climate uncertainty. And then we talked about the cryosphere. So sea ice in the Arctic and Antarctica where we've seen big changes in, in both already mountain glaciers, which is one of the uh, climate uh, elements that's, that's seen the most change over the last 100 years because of global warming, the potential for a collapse in Greenland and Antarctica and how that might work. And then we talk about heat waves, droughts and floods and forest fires and things like that, all from a slightly mathematical point of view. And then when I teach this course, and this is the site, I also talk about popular press and, and science and policy. And I guess I developed the perspective that when we teach these courses, based on the experience of, of teaching this, that, that we no normally think that students should learn first about climate dynamics in you know, atmospheric dynamics, ocean dynamics, and only then about climate change. But I think it is possible to teach climate change first. And then once the students are interested, some of them might decide to pursue deeper uh, uh, studies in ocean atmospheric climate dynamics. So and basically I'm saying, let's teach it in the opposite direction, climate change first, and only then climate dynamics. It seems to work well based on my experience. So I thought I'd mention that. And it was suggested that we do personal reflections. So I just wanted to mention briefly that I started like most of us as a physics math undergrad and then PhD in physical oceanography. And then I saw the light and got interested in, in physical oceanography and over the years found myself working in on all sorts of things. So is the Atlantic overturning circulation close to a tipping point? That's something we did a while ago. Is El Nino chaotic because of interaction with the seasonal cycle? Um, are ice ages driven by abrupt sea ice changes? Could wintertime Arctic convection uh, lead to above freezing temp continental tears, which is a, that's something I talked about today. This is a more recent work by Waning uh, Kang about the possibility that sudden stratospheric warming events could become more frequent in a warmer climate, et cetera, et cetera. I guess the common denominator to all of these are, they're all highly speculative, admittedly. Um, so I don't know whether they're important, but I do feel that it was fun to do all of that and I'm enjoying myself. So I'm um, highly recommending to any physics student who happen to see this to get into climate dynamics because it's fun. Of course, the question always rises, isn't it depressing to work on global warming and climate change all the time? So I want to say something about that. So if someone is concerned about the future and global warming, I guess the first thing to know about is the the Great Horse Manure Crisis of 1894. So I'm following these notes by Ben Johnson and here's the link. Um, so what is this Great Horse Manure Crisis? So by the late 1800s, um, all big cities, all large cities in you know London, New York and so on, used um, thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, carriages, horse sled carriages a day. So we're talking 50,000 horses per day. And each horse, if you allow me, I don't suppose the manure and, and urine were mentioned in this physics talk so far, so maybe I'm the first at least doing that. So each horse produces these things, unfortunately. And uh, so this is the total million, 2.5 million pounds of manure per day. And the Times newspaper in 1984 said, predicted that in 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. So that was the big, Horse manure crisis of 1894. And of course, by 1912, this uh, impossible problem was resolved because horses were replaced by car. And until today, uh, when you have an, an unsolvable problem, you have to remember that our ability to predict the future is very small. So that's what this says. Our ability to predict future innovations is very limited and it's good to use rose-colored glasses. Okay. Here's another do I have time for this? Yeah, another list of the seven worst tech predictions. So 
And the IBM president says that there's not going to be a world in the in workplace in the world for more than five computers. The tele someone says the television won't uh, have a market and that the uh, vacuum cleaners would be nuclear powered. There's no reason anyone would have a computer in their home and that the internet would collapse and so on and so forth. Bottom line is we have, we have had zero ability to predict major te technological innovations in the past. So hopefully that means that someone will come up with an innovation that would allow us to reduce emissions or maybe even extract CO2 from the atmosphere. So I think it's good to remain optimistic. And here's a couple of examples. So this is the cost of solar energy going down from 70 something dollars to 0 0.3. That's a, what, a 200 factor. It's, things normally get more expensive, but this has become 200 times cheaper and wind energy is much, much cheaper. So things are getting better. And um, I guess that's a good reason to remain optimistic. And that would be my last slide. So I'm happy to get additional questions. Okay, th thank you very much for this exciting talk. Uh, I don't want to take away time from questioning. Uh, Kerry already has his hand up. Kerry, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry to ask so many questions, but it was an interesting talk, Ali. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask about the mechanism you proposed um, in Antarctica, because in the Eocene, there was no ice apparently in Antarctica. And if I remember my Antarctica geography, the land itself was more like an archipelago back then with a lot of water. So do we expect to find alligator uh, remains in Antarctica from that period, or is there something else going on? Nice. So you remember the plot I showed before um, of um, the continental configuration, this one. You notice where Australia is. So part of Australia was south of the, of the Antarctic Circle. So it, it did experience um, it did experience polar night. And in that part, they found the fossil of a dinosaur chicken-sized dinosaur that had very, and they found the fossil of the brain of that, it was actually a juvenile dinosaur, and the brain had very large um, um, vision uh, lobes, indicating that this dinosaur was probably active during polar night, and if it was active during polar night, it probably means that the temperature was warm. So this is the most direct evidence I can cite that around Antarctica, things were warm as well. Of course, Antarctica now is covered by ice, so we can't tell more than that. But there is this way some indication that even in the Southern Hemisphere, climate was warm and uh, and so there's something to explain too. And maybe these explanations are relevant in that region as well. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Brad? Uh, thanks very much, Ali, for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, it was really nice. I, I was wondering if you could just uh, take a minute and uh, say a little bit about the um, lapse rate feedback that you skipped over. Absolutely. Okay, so... The two lapse rate feedbacks, one is in the tropics where what happens is you, if you warm the surface, then the upper, the upper troposphere warms more. That's just a result of convection. Um, so in the tropics, when you warm the surface by one degree, the upper atmosphere could cool by five or even more degrees. In the Arctic, it's a bit different. It's the opposite, actually. When the surface warms, the upper atmosphere warms less. And the reason is this inversion that happens in the Arctic. So. Inversion is this thing that we saw here. So this is the, the temperature profile in the high latitudes today. You can see this warming instead of cooling as you go up in the atmosphere. That's referred to as the inversion. And when you have warming, the surface, the inversion is disappears. And therefore, the surface warming is large, but the upper atmosphere warming is less. OK, so now this difference between the tropics and the high latitudes, where the tropics warm more at high altitudes and the Arctic warms more at the surface is one reason for this um, Arctic amplification. I won't say more than that, but that's basically the difference between these two lapse rate feedbacks is the reason, one important reason for Arctic amplification. I don't know if that was helpful at all. Yeah, thanks very much. Right. Uh, Yo. I'll just keep my question short. 
Um, yeah, just thanks for this elegant talk. And I was wondering, so for both part one, where you have 1D and sphere model, and part two, where you have this nice analytical solution of multiple equilibrium due to the convective um, cloud feedback, uh, you have this nice, elegant way to um, show that we actually understand the system. And I was wondering, when do you know, like for a new problem, for example, when do you know there's a possibility to build a reduced order model for these complex systems? Yeah, I mean, for, for me in the past, it turns out sometimes uh, we start with a simple model, play with it, think about it, find something interesting. And sometimes you start with a GCM and then you, you find something interesting in a large scale climate model, ocean model. And then we use simple arguments to explain that. So I think it could go either way. But I do love the combination of both, and I think many people uh, uh, would agree that, that 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 is the most fun and most uh, helpful way if you want to to both find new things and obtain understanding. So the, this hierarchical modeling approaches, I think, is uh, something most people will will agree is uh, is uh, the best way to go. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, again, uh, Ellie, thank you very much for this fantastic talk. And uh, yeah, let's thank Ellie. And yo, you have something to, like some closing remarks, right? Want to announce something? Yeah, I, I guess I just want to um, thank Ellie again. I think this is really a, a wonderful way to end our um, GPC seminar series for this academic year. Uh, so this is the last one for this this year, but um, I uh, we will resume um, the seminar series this fall, and I hope everyone have a good summer. Okay. With that, I think it's um time to end. And uh, thanks, Ellie, again, and thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>